Okay, Joe, I think we're ready to go, aren't we? Yes, we are indeed. So thank you Excellent. very much. Excellent. Excellent. Well, listen, before I start, I think it's just appropriate to, to give a hands up to, to Joe and the team that have organised this event. It, it's oh truly God. impressive. And, 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 and isn't it a demonstration of how the world has changed in the last you know, 18, 19 months for all of us. And, and I'm going to be talking today about selling and about sales. And of course, <laughs> sales is something that along with everything else has changed significantly over the last few years, but never more so than over the last couple of years. So just by way of introduction, I'm Rick Wilkinson. I'm the managing partner of a sales training and sales leadership training company. I'm based in Leeds in in West Yorkshire. I, I, I'm guessing that there's people from all over the country from a huge variety of businesses. And that's kind of typical of the sort of work I do. I work with, 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 with large, small, owner-managed businesses, perhaps across multiple sectors. And what I'm going to talk to today, or what I'm going to talk about in, in the next hour is around, you know, why it is that people buy. Uh, and as I put on the, you know, as I put on the, the slide there that, 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 that you'll be able to see on your screen, why people sometimes don't buy. We've all been there. Those, those prospects that, that we feel, we, we, you know, we just have that gut feel that we've got one, that this is a deal for, that's ours to lose. And yet for some reason, frustratingly, after all the time and effort that we've put in, they just don't close. So hopefully give you a few tips, a few hints, a few ideas. I'm going to go through quite a lot of content. So I'm going to move fairly quickly within this hour. If there's anything that I talk about that you'd like to discuss with me, if there's anything that you're not clear, if there's anything that I say that you don't particularly agree with, then by all means, contact me either through uh, the auditorium itself, or of course, on my email address, which is on the screen there, rick.wilkinson at sandler.com. So, so, so let's, let, let's kind of get started. And, you know, I wanted to start with, with a bit of a reflection of how things have changed. Now, you know, this is the un incorruptible cashier. This was invented by a guy called James Riley just after the American Civil War. He was a bar owner in Cincinnati in the US. And the problem that he had, because everything at that point, of course, was quill and ink, was that he had no way of stopping his staff from taking his money. And he came up and he patented what he termed the incorruptible cashier. It was the first ever electronic means by which we could control the movement of cash through our business. There was nothing like it. And he sold the business or he sold the patent at a later date to a guy who was a China and glass salesperson. And he set up a company called National Cash Registers. National Cash Registers, of course, became NCR and the rest of it is history, as they say. So why do I share this with you and as, as an example of how things have changed? Well, of course, their route to market given that this was such a completely revolutionary piece of technology was that they would drop themselves with a cashier at the start of a street and they'd knock on doors they'd walk down the street and they'd take orders because there was no logical reason why anybody would not want to invest in one of these these pieces of technology i mean a salesperson's idea of paradise but of course, things have changed. Very few of us are fortunate to live in the world where what we sell is an incorruptible cashier. The market is, is far more complex. Our buyer is far more informed. There is, I think, a degree of cynicism perhaps about salespeople, which we have to overcome, particularly if we want to have rational adult to adult conversations with a prospect and all of those things kind of come together to make it very difficult sometimes to qualify whether or not what the person that we're working with the person that we're investing our precious time and our precious resources with 
is 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 a is a genuine prospect or maybe he's just a suspect a suspect or a prospect Yet therein lies the problem because the two tend to look very similar your suspects are often interested inquisitive they're opening to listening to us but how they differ from a prospect is they lack the motivation to buy there's no compelling emotional reason that they would want to change what they're doing today which they know and they trust to do something different so our job of salespeople, of course is to qualify to protect that precious time that we've got in order to ensure that we spend it we invest it with people that have a reason to buy notwithstanding the fact that of course not buying doing nothing is often our competition it's not the guy or the girl down the street it's their natural caution to stick with what they know and trust even when that isn't perfect because if we think about it the value that we bring as a salesperson as a sales professional is in the information that we gather we gather that information through the insightful challenging questions that we ask more so than the information we give the information we impart Salespeople sometimes, and we can all fall into this trap, become rather eye centric. We like to talk about ourselves. We like to talk about our product because we know what a great product or service we have. We like to give information about our, our credentials, our service, our awards, all of which is very eye centric. It's sort of it's sort of a, a, akin to going into somebody in going up to somebody that we see in a bar that we might be attracted to and going over to them and saying hi what's your name and when they give us our na their name we say oh great shut up let me talk of all about let me tell you all about ourselves now i'm guessing if we did that chances of getting a second date are probably not particularly high right i mean they're just you know we're not going to get very far with that people like to talk about themselves people like to engage with people that are interested in them less so than themselves so being biocentric be rather than being eye-centric and the way that we have to be biocentric of course is by sometimes you know not talking about ourselves but asking insightful questions insightful questions allow us to understand whether or not there are reasons to do business often there may not be and if that's the case of course when do we want to know that do we want to know that in those early stages of the engagement at that first discovery meeting or do we want to know it when we've invested time over several meetings perhaps put together a proposal or a presentation before they find that actually they're going with our competitor or they're choosing the competitor which is do nothing so before i move on i wanted to share with you a little bit of a sort of personal insight if you don't mind i hope this doesn't come across as being too self-indulgent but this is me this is me with my eight-year-old horse shamrock and you know we i have been for many many years since i was a wee boy a very passionate equestrian event rider i i have far more passion for it however than i have ability unfortunately and, and as i get older it seems that i get worse I, I certainly know that when i come when the horse and i part company that certainly hurts a lot more and if i watch the professional riders what I see is how in control they are. How they seem to flow from one jump to the next jump. As they go over a jump, they're already focused on the next jump or maybe even the jump after that. Just like a golfer that's, that, that, that's not kind of focused on this swing. They're thinking, where do I need to put the ball in order to position for the next shot? 
for me, it's different. You know, in my world, I'm focused that fence that I'm coming up to at 35 miles an hour and thinking, how the heck do I get over this one? And as I land, hopefully intact on the horse on the other side, I then uh, start to look up and think, OK, so wh where do I go next? You no, know, maybe I've kind of gone off to the right where actually I should have gone off to the rest to, to the left. And, and, you know, sometimes I'll get round, perhaps more often than not. Tend to find that when I do and I'm talking to my coach afterwards, I'll say, I don't know. I mean, how was that? Did, 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 did it, you know, did it, did it feel, did it look OK? You know, my time wasn't very good. It didn't seem to be particularly efficient. And somehow I'm sort of, never mind how well I've done, I'm, I'm left with that feeling that, I don't know, it just didn't seem, it just didn't seem right. And the reason I mention that is that for many years, my pain discovery process, my pain discovery step in my sales qualification process kind of felt a little bit like that. You know, I come out of those meetings and when I talk about pain discovery, I'm talking about those early discovery meetings, qualification meetings, when I'm trying to assess whether or not I'm speaking with a genuine prospect or, or, or am I in fact speaking to a suspect, somebody that will gladly take all the information that I want to give them, will listen, will be interested, but ultimately won't buy. It kind of tended to feel a little bit like that. You know, was I asking the right questions? You know, did, did I sort of veer off track at some point and, and fail to find my way back onto the, because in, in truth, I think oftentimes I was winging it. Now, I, you know, I, listen, I did 35 years in the IT industry. I worked for big companies like Cisco and HP, and I worked for many, many small businesses. I ran teams, I ran territories, I ran my own company, but still kind of felt a little bit that I wasn't totally in control. And consequently, I'd come across those prospects that I thought were prospects, only to find out later in the process, you know what, they were a suspect. They'd taken all of my time and resources, but yeah, I didn't get the deal. I didn't get to go to the bank. So that's really what I'm gonna talk about today. A little bit of structure maybe, try and give you some ideas as to how we can approach that qualification as to whether or not they're prepared to change what they're doing today to do something different. Yeah, because we are all in the change business. Because when we think about it, you know, if we understand the prospect's need uh, and we believe that they've got a clear understanding of the value that we bring and how we bring that, and we know in our heart that we've got the ideal solution, well, then doesn't it follow that the business is ours to lose? Well, you might have thought so, and yet we still lose those deals. And I guess the question is kind of, why is that the case? Now, there can be lots of reasons, of course. It could be that we just focus too much on ourselves. We've got a preconceived idea of why they would want to buy from us. We're not engaging with real active listening. We're not questioning those wishy-washy statements that they make like we, we're quite interested. We don't pick up on those things or perhaps we're too intent on just telling rather than selling. And I, I, I would argue that selling is really about asking questions. So, you know, when I'm working with prospects and clients who are rightly proud of the products and the service that they deliver and the, the value that they deliver, and yet they're questioning, you know, why is it that my process doesn't seem to work? Why is it that I've got, in my mind, the best product or service out there with price competitive, we're, we're nice people, we build long-standing relationships with people that get value from us, and yet we don't win the business. And, and it's a good question. And, and my answer to that is that 
you know, many of those stalls and objections that we get from our prospects, or, or, or should I say perhaps our suspects, those people that say things to us like, I think I've got to think this over. I, I, I'm not sure that that's within our price bracket. I, I'm not sure with COVID that this is the right time for us to do that. Which, which of course may be genuine objections, but sometimes are what I would term a slow no or a polite no. They've already decided that they, they're not going to think it over. They've already decided it's a no. And in fact, the only person that's thinking it over is poor old me who's mulling over it over the weekend as to whether or not when I call them on the Tuesday, they're actually going to take my call. So if it's not the product or the service, then perhaps it's something to do with the interaction that we have with the buyer. How we're viewed by the buyer, because the question I ask is, do prospects believe everything that we say? What level of credibility do we have as salespeople? In my sales training courses, I often play a little word association game and we'll throw a few words out there and see what the immediate response is. We might say an engineer. And usually we get technical. We get design. I might say Uber and we'll get technology game changing burgers and chips when i say salespeople, it isn't pretty people say self-centered I'll, I'll get liar snake oil came up yesterday now i'm guessing that all of you that are listening to this are thinking well that's not me and i know it's not me either I know that I'm honest. I know that I have the best interest of my clients and that I'm not interested in working with somebody that either doesn't want to or doesn't need to work with me. I've worked with thousands of salespeople all across the world. And my, 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 what I know to be true is that 95% of those people are honest, hardworking professionals. Uh, emphasis on professionals people that are proud to be salespeople, as a doctor is proud to be a doctor and a lawyer is proud to be a lawyer and a school teacher is proud to be a school teacher. And yet we're not always seen that way, are we? You know, think about it. What defines and typifies the relationship and the psychology that's going on in the room when you're the seller and they're the buyer? Is it an adult to adult conversation or does it sometimes lapse into being more of a critical parent role that the buyer takes on and ourselves as the adaptive child doing everything that we can to keep our parent happy? And that, of course, is never going to be a foundation for a long term business engagement where we need to have adult to adult conversation. So over the years that I've worked with companies and I've analysed their current sales process before we go through a, a journey of change, of course, it varies and you will all have your own sales system, of course, and if I asked you to jot that down right now in, 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 in four, five, six, seven steps, starting with acquiring somebody that's interested, gaining a prospect at the prospecting end, and at the other end going to the bank, then I'm sure you can write down that gated process that you go through to qualify in or to qualify out. But here's an example of what I tend to see, and I've termed this the traditional sales model. I'm not suggesting it's everybody's model. I'm not suggesting it's your model. You might see elements of this that look familiar. And I call it the show up, throw up, beg and bother approach. Now, it's not an approach that doesn't work. I, I, I will say that I sold in this way myself for perhaps the first 15 years of my career, did a lot of big business, did a lot of small business, 
was was successful, but it was stressful. I think is the word that I would say. I wasn't the cash register guy that could walk along the street, show them my wares, do my demo, and then push the contract across the table. Buyers were already becoming more sophisticated, more knowledgeable, more skeptical. I think I was sounding, behaving, looking like every other salesperson that went into their office. There was no differentiation in the way that I was managing the sales conversation. And there was little differentiation in truth between products. As much as I told them that I had best, 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 much as I told them that I had the best thing since sliced bread, what I discovered was everybody's got sliced bread. So in the traditional sales model, we turn up, we do a bit of needs analysis, yeah? We, we, we ask some questions, often they're technical questions, or certainly in my world, they were technical questions. What sort of product are you using today? What are some of the challenges that you're having with that product? These are good questions. But what I learned, what I learned and what I came to understand is that people's decision to buy isn't solely made at that adult, adult level. If, you, if you've ever read any science or psychology around human buying decisions, what it will tell you is that people have a tendency to buy emotionally. Yeah, their child ego state has to want it. Before the adult then gets involved to justify that decision technically. And of course, the industry that knows this better than any other, of course, is the advertising industry. If you can sell loo roll if you can sell detergent emotionally then of course anything can be sold on emotion as well as from a technical point of view so 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 so, so i guess the question becomes are we going do we have the questions that we need to ask to get to that emotional understanding to understand their emotional commitment and reasons to buy because if we don't, we don't have a fully qualified prospect. We spent 10, 15 minutes asking some questions and then we get to what we were really there for sometimes because salespeople, they like to present their product. We can't wait to do their demo. Certainly again, I'll hold my hands up over the years, selling software, selling cybersecurity products, selling networking hardware we we can't wait to sort of launch into the deck the corporate deck that tells them everything including my mother's maiden name much of which is irrelevant and then of course having sort of thrown up and given them everything that we've got then we go to that place where we feel a bit of pressure because now we're looking to close the deal and of course, the prospect's not feeling particularly okay either. So, you know, both of us, unfortunately, are in that I'm not okay state. Whereas, of course, what we really want is I'm okay, you're okay. Which, of course, typically will result in some of those, let me think it over, some of those put offs and stalls, and then we start to bother them. Then I'm calling them the following day, of course. Now, the buyer, of course, and as I said, I think, I think when I was doing this, what I recognized was that maybe I'm just like every other salesperson. Maybe 20 minutes after I left their office, the truth is they couldn't remember whether I was from company A or company B because I did exactly that poor buyer, you know, has blood running out of their eyes because they sat through three presentations of 50 slides. Or, 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 or three hour long demos showing every feature and function that we have. And the buyer, of course, has identified that, seen that pattern of behavior. And of course, they have their own system. And it's a very powerful system. And it's one that you might recognize simply because you've probably done it yourself. You've probably done this yourself. So let's take a look at the buyer system. 
Now, typically, this can start with us professing some interest. If you're going to buy a car online, but you want to go and get a test drive, when you walk into that showroom, I'm guessing you're not going to say to the salesperson, look, I'm going to buy a car online, but I'd like to get some of your knowledge and experience. I'd like to have a look around it, get to smell that new car smell. Maybe take it for a test drive. Of course not. I'm going to, I'm going to profess, yeah, look, I'm here to buy a car. So step one of the buyer's process, tongue in cheek, listen, I don't wish you all to leave here thinking that all buyers are liars, but I think you'd profess that you probably do this yourself. They lie about their interest. Sometimes the more interested they appear, the less likely they are to buy because if they want to buy, they keep their cars close to their chest. They don't want to give you the sense of blood because they fear how as a salesperson you will react. They act really motivated. Again, we don't know why. Motivated because they're going to buy, motivated because they're collecting information, motivated because they're price checking. Who knows? Again, they tend to lie about that step. Now, question is, why do they do that? Why do they do that? Well, if you think about salespeople, we're the biggest source of free information out there with the exception of the Internet. Ask yourself this question, how much knowledge and, uh, and experience do you have that you carry around with you, that you've amassed over the, 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 the time of your career, that you've invested in? I'm guessing it's significant. You can solve problems. And oftentimes it is part of the buy system that that's actually what they're interested in. They wish to obtain free information. I, I, you know, they, they steal. Step one is that they lie. Step two is that they lie. Step three is they want to steal. They want unpaid consulting. And salespeople oftentimes, again, done it myself, only too happy. Give them everything that they want because I'm the adaptive child. They're the critical parent. I feel compelled to give them the, the information that they want. Now, of course, there's a bit of a game. And I understand we have to give some information in order to move things along sometimes. But I want something in, in, in return for all of that information that I'm going to give them that's so valuable. Because it's not the fact that the information is free that's attractive to our buyer. It's the fact that it's valuable. What I want in exchange is some level of commitment. Some level of commitment as to what's going to happen after I've made that presentation, after I've given them that proposal. And perhaps the way I'm doing that is to say, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, of course, I'd be happy to put together a proposal, a presentation that, that, that talks about the things that we've, we've covered and how we could help you address them. But let me, before we do that, let me ask you this question. What precisely is going to happen? What would we then do? What would we do next? Because I want some commitment. Now, of course, in the buyer system, they, they, they know it's coming. Yeah, they think that as salespeople, we went to train killer school. And at a train killer school, we were taught to get, to get a yes. So they're, they're prepared for this. <coughs> Excuse me. And they avoid that commitment. They avoid the commitment by saying things like, Rick, it sounds great. I really like what you do. But I think I probably need to talk to my business partner about this. I need to talk to my finance director to see whether or not we've got those kind of funds available. And we get into that sort of objection handling you know, they throw something at us and we throw it back again. And we, we, you know, maybe we're addressing the right objection or maybe the objection is something completely different. Maybe it's just that they've decided to say no. So typically they're going to lie about yeah, Rick. This was great. Uh, you know, I, I, I can see no reason why at some point in the future we might want to do something with you. And I'll tell you what, Rick, why don't you give me a call next week? And of course, then we know what happens. 
suddenly we've got a prospect that's gone into hide mode it's like the minute we left their office and i guess you know we'll all have been there the minute we left their office it was like they'd entered the prospect protection program all we've got is a lifetime subscription to their voicemail but the prospect isn't taking our call even though they said rick it's great give me a call on tuesday now i've been demoted from being a consultant albeit unpaid who's who, who's who holds the room who's knowledgeable who's respected now i'm kind of hovering around their voicemail like some kind of fly i'm an insect i'm investing my time my my emotional energy in trying to bring back to life something that likely or possibly was dead some time ago but the prospect didn't feel comfortable to tell me no because their perception of salespeople was i went to train killer school and i'm only interested in getting a no sorry getting a yes so the buyer's system is typically something when i talk about it it's a little bit of a lights on moment we've all done it ourselves we perhaps all see our prospects doing this to us and it's a powerful system and typically unless we have a better system then the buyer system is the one that will take the lead so we'll talk a little bit about what a system is and what it looks like and as i say you probably have your own system that will counter the buyer system but before we do that let's just think about why it is people that buy you know why it is that people choose to buy or not buy well effectively probably four reasons in fact again buyer psychology talks in terms of these four reasons you know, the frontal lobal part the frontal lobe part of the brain is that emotional part where we make buying decisions in our child ego state people buy because they've got pain now we can all think of what pain might be you're losing clients your customer service is dropping your production isn't efficient and your and consequently your prices are out of line with your competition in a personal level your car has broken down you can't get to meetings pain in the present pain in the future which we might think of as being fear maybe that's that's something that you know you know you're coming to the end of a warranty on your manufacturing equipment perhaps it's some form of regulation that's coming down the line that you know you're going to need to comply with to continue to win new clients and then on the other side there's the pain side pain or pleasure both now or in the future we can think of a pension as being that it, it might be 30 years hence but we know that that's going to be something that's going to be a big game for us in the future it could be that if we invest in this way we it won't prevent us it's not about preventing us from losing clients it's about it'll open up a new market for us so we're going to gain something through this investment but of all of those buying emotions of all of those buying emotions you can probably imagine which is the most compelling and it's pain in the present let's think about that if you've got one of those compelling problems right now everything else oftentimes including money and time and resources becomes insignificant or less significant because we need to solve that problem it it, it feels life-threatening so our job as a salesperson of course is to understand deeply the emotional compelling and personal reasons why somebody might want to change what they're doing today in order to do something different and i think sometimes if we're not careful we assume there's a need and there's an understanding of our product or service therefore doesn't it follow that they should buy our product but but it doesn't take into account the other priorities that they've got the importance they place on fixing this problem and how it affects them personally how it affects them emotionally and how it affects the business 
on a financial level. Again, if we don't know that, we can't say that we've got a fully qualified prospect. Buyers, the, 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 the problems that the buyer brings to us, the sort of things that they might say to you. You know, Rick, I'd like to have a conversation with you about our software application that we're using for CRM. Because the guys aren't using it. That's a problem, but it's not the real problem. There could be several reasons why the guys aren't using the CRM system. And sometimes we leap in too early. We move from what I would term being a doctor. And if you think about it, a doctor is there to, to understand the nature of the problem. Rick, move your arm up, move your arm down. Let's try and figure out what's wrong before we become the surgeon that says, okay, Rick, here's what I think we need to do. We've diagnosed the problem at a root cause level. Now let us talk about what it is I think we need to do to fix it. So we're going to talk about that essence of why people choose to buy or not buy which is do they have actionable pain because really this is where the sales made pain equals motivation it equals motivation for them to change what they're doing today and if we if, if we really focus in on that you know on that pain, then the, the, the anatomy of pain, if you like, really has these three elements. There's the observable surface level problems, which a prospect usually will bring to us or will be prepared to talk to us about. Everybody has a need or has needs. They don't always like to acknowledge and, and admit, uh, admit to it. Sometimes they haven't self-diagnosed themselves what the cause of the problem is. So that oftentimes we have that observable surface level problem. And I'll give you an example in a moment. But we need to understand what the causes are. We need to understand why that is happening, because, of course, there can be many reasons. And it is through the questions that we ask that we uncover that. But we also start to take the prospect on a journey of self-discovery. And we demonstrate our knowledge and our credibility of the subject at hand through those questions that we ask. In fact, much more so than just starting to talk and present and be all I centric. So we've got to understand the surface level problem, the causes. And of course, we have to then understand the impact. Everybody has needs. Not everybody is a buyer. We've got to understand the business, the personal impact of that problem. If we, if we can bring those three pieces of the puzzle together, the three elements, uh, three elements of the anatomy of the pain discovery step in our process, then, we, then we're in a position to qualify whether or not this is a suspect or whether this is a prospect. So I wanted to give you a bit of an example, a bit of a real world example of, of, of a sort of more a, a way that I find this works in, in, in a kind of structured way. That takes us through those steps of the pain puzzle. And I, again, I'm going to use my business, my industry which I hope isn't too self-serving, but it's the industry that I know. And I didn't want to insult anybody by trying to use a different industry and just using bad examples. So, so typically when I'm talking to a prospect that I've made a cold call to, or I've, I, I've met at some form of event, or I've been given, a, I've asked for and been given a referral to, and I say to them, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, you know, typically when, I can get it together with somebody like yourself, a business owner, a business leader. There's one or two things that they've sort of got on their mind that they'd like to maybe discuss with me. Is that the case here? Is there something specific that you'd like us to cover in the next hour? And one of the things that very often will come up is something like this. You know, my guys aren't getting enough appointments. OK, so it's a symptom potentially a very important symptom, but it's a, it's a pain indicator. My guys aren't getting enough appointments. Okay, okay, 
Yeah, I hear that a lot, Mr. Prospect, Mrs. Prospect. What I'm thinking, of course, is, OK, let's X-ray that. Let's X-ray that. And what I know through my knowledge and experience is it's probably either it, it's an effort problem or it's a skill problem. So let's start to diagnose that. Let's take on that hat of being the doctor before we start to diagnose and then uh, and then suggest a remedy. Let's let's just get into that a little bit. So that my prospects said, well, you know, my guys just aren't getting enough appointments. OK, so is that an effort problem or a skill problem? In, in other words, is that because you haven't agreed a weekly prospecting plan that you're tracking? and that you're holding the team accountable to? Or, or, or is it that you've got that plan, you know, that, 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 that's documented and, uh, and that the team are accountable to, but the plan just isn't working? You know, we, 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 you know typically that's, you know, it's one of those two things. In your case, I mean, is, is, is it, what, which, what do you think? Chances are the prospect's going to say, well, Rick, it's either a bit of both. It's either a bit of both or, you know, well, I don't know. I guess we don't have a weekly behavior plan. OK, OK, I want to mull on that a little bit. I want, I want my prospect to see that the wheels are going round in motion here. OK, OK, not, not unusual, Mr. Pros Mr. or Mrs. Prospect. Because. Now my prospect's thinking about this. Well, I guess I'm not really sure how I'd even go about putting up a plan. You know what? I've never sort of had that kind of plan. Okay, no, no, I get that. You know, not unusual. So now I've got, you know, now I've got a cause. The problem is they're not getting enough appointments. I know why they're not getting appointments. They just don't have a prospecting plan that they're holding themselves accountable to and that's working. Before I want to go and diagnose a solution to this and leap into presentation mode, I want to know whether or not that's even relevant. I want to know whether there is a reason for them to put together a plan, either with me, with some other sales trainer or coach or, or, or internally. So I want to understand the third step, the third element of the anatomy of the pain of uh, 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 the pain puzzle, which is the impact. So, I mean, if you had a prospecting plan that you're executing on and holding yourself accountable, I mean, what, what specifically would change? Now, there's going to be other add-on questions here because the emphasis is specifically, how many more appointments do you think you'd book? How, how many are you booking right now? How many appointments do you need to close a deal? Is it one in three, one in five, one in 10? What, what is a typical deal? Okay, so we think we could close two more deals. Average deal is 25,000 pounds revenue, 5,000 pounds profit. Okay, let's do the sums for me, Mr. Prosper. And, and this has been going on for how long? Okay, three years, okay. And you have how many salespeople? Let's do the sums. Let's get to that business impact. Let's invest our time because this is where the sale is made or the sale isn't made. So I'll give you another quick example. I'm just, it's just taking too long to close deals. I hear this a lot at the minute. I don't know why that is. I hear this a lot. Okay. Now I wonder, well, is this, is this an issue of control or is this an issue of qualification? You know, qualification, is it before the presentation that the, the prospect disappears or, 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 or fails to, to make a decision? Or is it after the presentation we're losing control? So is that because you don't have a commitment in advance of doing the presentation that they will make a decision at the end? Or, you know, do you get that kind of commitment up front, but the prospect just kind of breaks it? I, I don't think truthfully, you know, we really get a, a sort of upfront commitment that they're going to make a decision at the end of it, be that yes or no. Got it. OK, be because you don't believe that that would help or you're not sure, kind of sure what, how you would ask that, how you get that kind of commitment. 
no, I mean, I think it would help, but, but you know, it's a difficult thing to ask for, isn't it? I mean, how would I do that? Now, again, at this point, I don't want to leap into rescuing them. I don't want to start giving free consulting. I've already demonstrated my knowledge of the subject and through that, the sense that I can fix it for them. Again, let's talk about impact. Let's talk about what it would mean to you if you fix that. What's your typical sales cycle? How many deals have you got in motion? What would it mean if we could take that from six months and make it five months? Or if we could qualify out earlier in order that we invest the time that we've got with people that are going to buy. Really about understanding why people would be motivated to buy. People buy for their reasons, not yours. If we have one product and one service alone, I'm guessing that for many of you, each prospect, each client will buy it for a different reason, not for our reasons. Our job is to understand their reasons, the significance of those reasons, their commitment to change through the questions that we ask. Now, I'm focusing, of course, on one element of the, of, of the, pros, of, of the qualifying stage, which is reasons to do business, which we call pain. I'm not talking here about step two, step three, which is around budget, resources, investment, and the decision-making process. Simply don't have time to do that today, but ultimately the sale is typically made or not made in the pain step. So my takeaway for you guys is that if you feel that you don't have a system, if you, if you were to ask every one of the people in your business that are engaged in selling to write down, document their gated sales process, would they do it off the bat? And would it be the same between every salesperson? Or would they have to really think about it? And what we end up with was a bunch of different sales approaches. Very difficult to scale, very difficult to manage when we're all doing things in our own way. So I'll share with you in the last five minutes. I'll try and wrap this up in five. And then if there's any questions, I'm happy to take that. If not, contact me if you'd like to through rick.wilkinson at sandra.com. You can contact me on LinkedIn. You can contact me through my booth uh, in, in, in the show. And of course, um, you can contact me through my mobile phone as well. I'm going to talk about a system now. Of course, there are many systems out there. I think it's more important that you have a system than which system it is. But it needs to be a system that's more powerful than the buyer system. It needs to be based on control, that we have control, but we're only ever going to get control an equal business stature, a adult to adult relationship as against that critical parent child relationship. If we've got permission, if our prospect feels comfortable with the way in which we're managing the process. So this process is based or the system is based on control, but with permission. And, a, and it's based on helping our prospect to discover the cause and the impact of the problems that they've got. Oftentimes they don't haven't considered the real root cause and they certainly haven't liked to go to that place where they start to understand what it's truly costing them. So discover versus convince. Convince is the traditional model. We can't convince anybody of anything. The only person that can, that, 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 that can convince somebody is them themselves. And this is the system. It's a, this is the soundless selling system. It's a seven step gated process. The first two steps are around bonding and rapport and setting agreements as to what's going to happen at the end of every meeting. It's about establishing sometimes in front of an aggressive or uh, skeptical buyer that we are going to differentiate ourselves through the way that we behave, through the way that we conduct ourselves. We're going to create differentiation. It's going to be an adult to adult conversation. And then the next three steps, pain, budget and decision. 
are the qualification steps. Any point along that, 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 that journey, we may decide to qualify out. And if we don't qualify out, we certainly might decide that we need to test the prospect because if they want it, they'll fight us for it. So the pain step we've talked a lot about, actionable pain, goes way beyond just needs. It's got to be compelling, emotional and personal. The budget step is about willingness and ability. We've all had those clients that are willing, but they're just not able. They don't have the budget. Or those that are able, they've got the budget, but they're just not willing. Those are the ones we've lost, right? Yeah, the ones that they just weren't prepared to invest that money with us now. And then finally, the decision making process. Sure as eggs are eggs are eggs. If I say to a prospect, are you the decision maker in this process, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect? They're typically going to say yes. It's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Are you the decision maker? Are you important? Perhaps just a simple rephrasing of that question where we say typically, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, when I'm working with people like yourselves and the decision to be made that's important, there's, there's several people involved in that. Is that the case within your organization? And what does that look like? Provide a bit of social proof so they feel compelled to say, well, I'm not the only decision maker. Before we even get to that final fulfillment presentation proposal step, now we've got the opportunity to present to a fully qualified prospect that is prepared to make a decision at the end of the presentation or proposal. And if not at the end, at some defined point that's acceptable to, and, and understood by us, the who, the why, the where, the what, the when of that decision making process. We finally get to use that critical product knowledge to show how we can fix the problems we've unearthed. This is not the time for the dog and pony show. It's not the time to show, throw all the spaghetti at the wall, hoping that something will fix. Likelihood is if we introduce things that they haven't found important because we think they're important, we could end up damaging our, our, ourselves. We could end up stepping on our own toe. Oh, Mr. Prospect, Mrs. Prospect, did I mention the, the upgrade we've got coming next month? Whoa, upgrade? What's involved with that? Hang on a minute. Yeah, so we present to fix the problems that we've identified within the budget uh, in terms of investment of people, resources and money. And then finally, the final step in the process, when we've got that yes decision, before we go and, you know, and, and, and ring the bell, before we take our spouse out for dinner, is that post sell step when we, we, we have the verbal rehearsal to avoid buyer's remorse. Or, or, or vendor vengeance. How, how are we going to deal, Mr. or Mrs. Prospect, with the fact that you've been dealing with company X for 20 years, 10 years, five years? You've got a good relationship with them, they've serviced you well. I'm guessing they're not going to be sending me a congratulatory card. In fact, they're probably going to drop their prices 20%. How, how are we going to, you know, how are you going to deal with that? Because what we don't want is that conversation on the Monday morning when things suddenly have changed and we, 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 we've snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. So, guys, I don't have time to spend any more on that system. Some of you might be familiar. I'm sure some of you have gone through Sandler or familiar with Sandler. We are the world's largest sales training, sales leadership coaching business that works with companies from from Apple and, 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 and you know, uh, large global enterprises down to, uh, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I mean in terms of employees down to thousands and thousands of one person companies. Hope I've given you something to think about, hope I've maybe challenged some of your thoughts. As I say, happy to have a conversation with any of you. We can put half an hour aside uh, and, uh, and, and get that in the diary. I'll leave you with the success triangle. Sales is all about our attitude, our attitude to ourselves, to our product and to our market. It's around our technique, the tactics, strategies that we use, and it's around our, plan, our behavior, our plans, our goals, our daily activities.
Thank you very much, guys, for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference and enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you. Let me get through.